Good evening. I'm Matthew Swanson, Associate Director of Choruses for the Cincinnati May Festival. On behalf of Principal Conductor Juan Jomena and Director of Choruses Robert Porco, welcome to this live stream event. You've just been listening to a recording of John Adams' Short Ride in a Fast Machine by the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra and their music director, Louis Langray. Since its very first concert in 1873, the May Festival has welcomed many of the world's great conductors, composers, singers, and instrumentalists to the stage of Music Hall. That long tradition was to continue this season as well. The composer and conductor John Adams was the 2020 May Festival artistic partner, and he was slated to conduct a performance of his own Nativity Oratorio, El Nino. In addition, the May Festival was mounting a staged production of his song play, I was looking at the ceiling and then I saw the sky. Unfortunately, we were not able to bring these plans to fruition. But tonight, we hope you might enjoy excerpts from my conversation with John Adams earlier this week. He took a break from composing to speak with me from Northern California. And we began by discussing his early life and formative musical education as recounted in his 2008 autobiography, Hallelujah Junction. I was struck by the fact that your childhood, uh, the way you recount it in your book, has both elements of being very ordinary and then also elements of being rather extraordinary uh, in terms of the musical experiences that you had. And I, I wonder uh, what your thoughts about that might be. Well, I think uh, anyone who has children realizes that, that children are naturally creative. Um, and it's really up to the adults to identify that urge and, and to feed it and nurture it. Um, unfortunately, a lot of adults, uh, without meaning anything wrong, just simply don't identify it. And in my case, I was really lucky because both of my parents were, um, they loved music. Uh, they were both very musical, but because they had grown up during the depression, um, they had had the opportunity to, you know, get decent training. So um, when they saw that interest in me, they, they did everything they could to uh, um, foster it. I was also uh, interested by the fact that there was um, a kind of consistent presence of classical music culture in the house through recordings and then later through music lessons. And I know you've spoken in other venues about the pervasiveness of pop culture uh, in American history, um, or rather in current American society. Are you concerned about the ability for young people to access classical music? Yes, I am concerned. I've always been concerned. And yet, uh, I look around and, you know, this country continues to produce just an astonishingly talented musicians. I mean, you go to Europe where, you know, there's great culture for classical music, but, um, you know, really, I think, you know, pound for pound, we really produce more expert uh, and highly gifted um, uh, classical musicians. Um, I, I work almost every year. I go and do a week with the New World Symphony in Miami Beach. Uh, <clears throat> I like to go and conduct a Juilliard Orchestra and a Yale School of Music. And um, even in my hometown here, Berkeley, California, we have uh, an extraordinary middle school uh, which is exclusively for musically talented kids. And, um, you know, despite the pervasiveness of, of commercial music um, and the constant battle for funding, particularly in the public schools, um, we still produce this um, amazing musical culture and we have all these wonderful orchestras all over the country. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about the difference between perhaps the popular music of your uh, adolescence and early adulthood and the popular music of today. And what's the difference, for example, uh, between Brian well, Wilson and Ariana Grande? Yeah. 
Well, uh, I would be rather uh, incautious to try to say that because I, I don't really follow pop music today. I really do think pop music is very much, um, it's a kind of uh, communication medium uh, that, that sort of horizontally works among age groups. I, mean, I remember my parents they came alive at the at the mention of Benny Goodman or, or <clears throat> Duke Ellington and uh, my sister who was 11 years older than me loved you know, Frank Sinatra and the Kingston Trio and I grew up um, in the era of rock and my own kids uh, listened to Radiohead and um, rap and things like that so it really is very much a generational thing uh, and beyond that, I, I would be foolish to uh, uh, draw any comparisons because I'm just not very informed with, with what's going on today. I wonder if um, you might talk about your teachers at Harvard, specifically your composition teachers, Errol Kim and Kirchner, <clears throat> who are, um, I guess I would say it's rare to find either of them on a concert program these days, but quite common to find their student, John Adams, on a concert program these days? You know, I was in school during a very difficult time uh, in con contemporary music. Um, it was the period when 12-tone um, music and just sort of post-war sensibility that came from Europe was very prestigious. I, I say that word advisedly because it wasn't popular but it was prestigious and music critics uh were somewhat i think actually kind of intimidated by um the author authoritarian tone of, of of many of the leading figures of that uh era people like pierre boulez for example or elliot carter or uh milton babbitt um and the the teachers that I studied with, my, my professors, uh, of course, they were composers, um, and I, I felt that they, they all had extraordinary musical instincts, um, but they were those instincts were, were frustrated because of the, the, you know, the, the tenor of the times. Uh, it was also a period, it's hard to describe today, you know, 40 years later, that there was a time when um, if you wrote something that uh, you considered accessible for, uh, but not, not, not the proverbial man in the street, but, but let's say an audience that appreciated Beethoven or Mozart, um, if you wrote something that spoke to that kind of audience, you, you were, it was considered that you were slumming or you, you know, you were uh, uh, being um, prostituting your, 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 yourself in order to gain appreciation. So it was, it was a very kind of puritanical uh, uh, atmosphere that uh, I came of age in when I was in college in the um, late 60s and early 70s. And as I wrote about in my book, I... I physically had to get away from the East Coast and away from the university. So, hence I made that uh, that uh, sort of pioneer trip out to the West Coast, and I've remained out here very happily ever since. It, it seems like that it, it's a very difficult thing for anyone to teach composition to another person. How how does the process of teaching composition proceed effectively? You know, I I don't know. Uh, I think uh, I can only think of a handful of, of of people who are I consider really good composition teachers, and and very few of them actually were great composers. They just happened to be people who um, had a gift for illuminating, um, you know, the repertoire for a young composer to make that composer aware uh, of what's great in, in a given piece of music and to stimulate um, that composer's uh, 
craft and and sophistication um you know i think that it it a lot of students particularly graduate students people in their 20s and you know sort of haven't quite found their voice um but they want to be composers they they tend to be um very expectant they want some magic bullet from their professor or their teacher um and they get you know they can be very hypercritical if if they don't hear what they want and nowadays you know there's there's such sensitivity cultivated within the university environment um that i i think a lot of teachers are almost um cautious overly cautious about even making criticisms for fear of offending the student um other than that i i think it's just a kind of magical gift um to be a, a great composition teacher uh, i'm not sure i have it myself but i i occasionally meet with young composers and um try to uh, help them identify what in their uh piece is is promising and of value and perhaps of where they've gone wrong in in not identify making that identi- identification at age 23 john adams left new england and moved to northern california as he mentioned where he has remained since his path to a place of prominence in american musical life was not linear however his initial employment in the bay area included stints as an assistant manager in his apartment building and as a worker in a clothing import warehouse. He received a chance offer to join the faculty of the San Francisco Conservatory and lead its prominent new music ensemble through an adventurous list of avant-garde music, including many early works from his own pen. In this next excerpt, John talks about those early West Coast years, including his acquaintance with minimalism and his first major work for orchestra and chorus, Harmonium. I began by asking John how the development of his distinctive compositional voice proceeded. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it was zigzag because uh I as I was in school during a period when, you know, the the gods were composers like Schoenberg and Stravinsky and uh I rebelled against that, although I have to say that, you know, I I pretty much knew a lot of that repertoire. I mean, it wasn't like I I was uh, a know nothing. I I actually absorbed a lot of of the repertoire, and then I rebelled against it. And you know, I became a follower of John Cage, which of course infuriated and appalled my professors. <laughs> and you know, when I first came to out to the West Coast, I, I did a lot of concerts of of encore, John Cage style music. But um, I grew quickly very uh, disenchanted with music that was created, you know, by arbitrary decision making, whether it was tossing coins or consulting I Ching or using a computer to make choices or something like that. Um, so I think probably the, you know, when I, when I started to actually find my own voices, when I, when I heard my first, uh, examples of early minimalism pieces by Steve Reich and Terry Riley and, uh, Philip Glass. And, uh, I think the reason that, that, uh, I was excited by that was that it was in music. Uh, first of all, it was tonal and I had ever since you know my first encounter with atonal music i i had uh never been able to find a way to to love that and and uh of course we were being told that tonality was dead etc cetera, etc cetera. um even though everybody was listening to the beatles <laughs> and uh so in in a minimalism i found that use of tonality a very a very novel use of it uh and then you know the music had had a pulse which was something that 
I need to have. Uh, what I was dissatisfied with about um, most minimalist procedure was that it was kind of inflexible and rigorous and that there were many aspects of the human experience, um, uh, you know, a vast range of emotional states that minimalism didn't seem to be able to uh, access, you know, because in a way it was very pure, kind of in the way that like Telemann or, you know, certain kinds of Baroque music is. Um, so that was, you know, that's how I forged my own language was to uh, take that style that was both tonal and use pulsation and to a certain extent uh, uh, utilized aspects of, you know, re repetition, um, but to search right off the start for a language that was more emotionally complex and um, a piece that was done by the Cincinnati Symphony some years back, uh, I think it was conducted by James Conlon, if I'm not r wrong there, uh, Harmonium, uh, was my actual first big piece for chorus and orchestra. And, I, and I, you know, it's a, a good case of how I uh, ap approached the challenge of creating my own uh, voice. Yes, you are correct. That was in the 2014, and it was performed both yeah. here in Cincinnati and at Carnegie Hall. Uh, and I'm right. so glad you brought it up because Harmonium is um, extraordinary for many reasons, not least of all because it falls into this interesting genre of choral symphony, which itself is um, quite select in the repertoire, but also, if I'm not mistaken, is really your first large-scale orchestral effort. Yes, I'd written one orchestra piece before then, which uh, I conducted with the San Francisco Conservatory Orchestra. Um, but it was, you know, it was a, a kind of, a, you know, a, a study piece, a piece of, of you know, composer still trying to find his voice. But um, yeah, Harmonium was was kind of beginner's luck in a way because I, I'd never written for the human voice before and I'd never written for, obviously I had, hadn't written for big orchestra. And I just, you know, took the bull by the horns and wrote this big piece, uh, 30 minutes long for several hundred performers. And that was 1980 and um, this piece still continues to get done a lot. It opened the BBC proms last year and it's been performed really uh, and very often. So I feel very fortunate that I kind of got a bullseye on my first piece. I certainly did. How did the um, texts for Harmonium uh, come together? Well, that's a funny story because I, uh, I originally imagined a piece that didn't have a text that the chorus would just, you know, sort of vocalize. And um, I quickly realized that that would be a very problematic thing and it wouldn't be much fun to sing uh, for 30 minutes, you know. It's okay to ooh and ah for a, f a few minutes at the end of Pulse Planets or uh, Debussy's uh, Nocturnes, but but um, you really need a text. And furthermore, text adds such a uh, an important level of of meaning. And um, I I confess that I just I had this big volume of poetry, and I I went through it just looking for something. And uh, I I found this poem by John Donne, which I didn't really understand because you know it's a metaphysical poem from that period of the late 17th century and those poems really need a lot of study but I love the title it sounded to me like a a punk band the title was negative love and the idea of starting a work with with negative you know with no 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 uh appeal to me. Um, and then as I studied the poem and began to understand it, uh, you know, it, it 
it gave me more ideas of what to do. Um, and I can't remember how I found the two Emily Dickinson poems. One would not naturally associate Emily Dickinson with John Donne, but in fact, um, they were both very spiritual, uh, and I guess you could say metaphysical poets. And what they talk about in both poems is really uh, kind of out-of-body states. I mean, they use the natural world, particularly Emily Dickinson, her imagery of the sea and, uh, the, you know, the famous poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, is this very slow kind of a camera crawl through a New England village uh, as we follow these horses that are drawing a coffin to the cemetery. And um, so it's, it, it's, it's kind of a cinematic uh, slowed down movement, which um, appealed to me very much.
In his first concert as director of the San Francisco Conservatory New Music Ensemble, John Adams led a performance of Guillaume de Machaut's Messe de Notre Dame. The mass dates to the mid 14th century, and it is the first known cyclic setting of the Roman Catholic Mass Ordinary. It is a work that sounds bold, adventurous, and contemporary even today, more than six centuries after its composition. John conducted the work from the stage while a newly composed electronic tape accompaniment played sounds of traffic noise and footsteps, an aesthetic he acknowledges would reappear 30 years later in his celebrated work on the transmigration of souls. I was so pleased, but also very surprised to read uh, on, I think, two occasions of your interest in the Machot Messe de Notre Dame. Yeah, I, I had uh, bought a record of that way back in the early 70s. Um, I can't remember who performed it, but it, 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 it was a very wacky uh, rendition. Um, I don't know how authoritative authoritative it was but it it sounded very contemporary in the way it was done um and i love the open intervals and the strange kind of uh oracular feel to it, it reminded me a little bit of lenos <laughs> um so uh yeah i i suppose i took some inspiration from that piece as well I have some questions here that were submitted by members of the May Festival Chorus who were so very mm -hmm. much looking forward to meeting you and working with you. Uh -huh. uh, if you well, I look forward to, I look forward to having a rain check on this very much so. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, one of them asks, uh, what aspects of your uh, compositions do you feel performers often miss or, or fail to realize? <laughs> uh, that's an un unusual question. Um, you know, I, I would have to turn that question around and, and, and say, you know, what am I doing that's making your life miserable? <laughs> uh, you know, because I do know that, that uh, particularly singers, you know, they have to work very hard to nail my rhythms. Um, uh, I was just watching uh, a documentary that a filmmaker made of my most recent opera, and there's a wonderful uh, little scene there of the great uh, soprano Julia Bullock, uh, who's working with another wonderful soprano, Janai Bridges, uh, who are both in sang in this opera, and they're both, you know, one of them was helping the other, learning a really tricky passage of mine and it's very intimate the camera's right there and of course the composer Mr. Adams isn't there uh, they would have been very embarrassed if they knew that I was in on this but to actually watch them um, and watch them struggle and how much they cared about getting right it really it, it was a very humbling experience and I felt deeply appreciative of uh of how hard particularly singers work to uh, master my music. Um, but I hope they realize that the, the things that are difficult are difficult for a reason. They're difficult because when I set text, 
I care deeply about the text sounding right, that it sounds the way we, particularly we as Americans, talk, the kind of rhythm uh, that we import to the words. Um, and it's not kind of sing song, uh, back and forth, nursery school or pop song kind of rhythm. It's, it's a much more complex rhythm. And I work very hard to make things sound right. But when it ends up on the paper, on the music staff, it's often difficult to learn. Um, but people learn it. I just a year ago, I went to Rome to do my big oratorio of a full evening piece, the gospel according to the other Mary, which has huge and very difficult chorus part. I wrote it for the Los Angeles master chorale because they could do anything. And um, I, I frankly was very anxious. I was expecting, you know, God knows what in Rome, you know, because it was Italian people singing in English and my music with all its syncopations. And instead, they just blew me away with this phenomenal performance. They had worked so hard. And I, I was just deeply moved to, you know, go to this foreign city in a different culture and experience my, my choral uh, writing being sung at such a supremely high level.
this gives me a chance to bring up something I was particularly looking forward to in the May Festival, which was a performance of, I was looking at the ceiling and then I saw the sky, which as I understand posed no small challenge in terms of text setting. Yeah, as, uh, I was looking at the ceiling and then I saw the sky, which is a beautiful title that my librettist, uh, June Jordan, she found it uh, in a quote from a, a survivor of an of a earthquake in Southern California. It's a wonderful image like the, you know, the uh, ceiling just collapsed and the person saw the sky. And we call it for shorthand, we call the piece Ceiling Sky. And it's a show and for which I wrote 20 pop songs. Uh, and uh, it, took, it took a full year to write that. Writing pop songs is hard, really difficult, because you have to come, have to get your best idea right out in the first few seconds of the song. And, you know, we classical contemporary composers were indulged a lot. You know, we take, often take an awful lot of time to get things off and running. And, and uh, it was a wonderful challenge to write uh, songs in the in the pop genre um and my librettist was a very famous poet june jordan um and also a a, a great uh essayist on on african-american culture um her poems that she wrote for me were you know they weren't neat little iambic pentameter versicles they you know they were more kind of typical free verse that most contemporary composers, I'm mean, sorry, that most contemporary poets uh, write in these days. And to find a way to take those, those jagged lines, you know, one line might have uh, 20 or 30 syllables and the next line, maybe just four, et cetera, et cetera, and wrap them around into uh, the kind of, harmonic regularity that a good pop song has is was uh, a, a real challenge i i was sweating bullets for uh much of the time that i was doing it but i you know when i listen back on those songs i i get a great deal of delight uh, because they're pop songs and yet they're they're not predictable they have crazy phrase lengths and and you know the the changes come where you least expect them. And I think that gives them a great deal of charm. I would agree with that. You may be gratified to know that I think I've had the hook of the opening number stuck in my head for about seven months now. <laughs> well, you can uh, enjoy that some more because um, there's a new Netflix, uh, sorry, a new HBO series coming out um, that was directed by... Uh, Luca Guadagnino, an Italian director who used my music in the uh, Oscar-nominated film Call Me By Your Name, and he's uh, made a new series, which is uh, about young people sort of trying to find their identity and uh, kind of, uh, sort of a love comedy uh, Netflix series. I keep saying Netflix, pardon me, it's HBO. And he uses a lot of uh, ceiling sky music in that series. I thought everything was over and I had lost my lover. I thought my life was permanently out of order I thought everything was over Because my world lay on the wrong side of some arbitrary border I thought that love and all the freedom of the air Would only last a while before they had to disappear I thought that I was preordained to fail And that I'd never managed to stay out of jail Thought she'd never give me anything much But still I was dreaming About the weight and the temperature Of her possible touch I thought he would never settle down From chasing women all over town 
I thought I'd end up old and lonely Because one or another female wanted to be my one and only I thought there was something the matter with me Something only I couldn't see I thought love was strictly extracurricular to what's important And that sex in general is not particular I was looking at the ceiling I was looking at the ceiling I was looking at the ceiling, and then I saw the sky. I was looking at the ceiling, I was looking at the ceiling, I was looking at the ceiling, and then I saw the sky. I was miserable and aching at the way the news kept breaking. I was looking at the ceiling, and then I saw the sky. I felt broken into compromise with nothing left to hope or prize. I was searching for a reasonable reason for my smile. I was finding what I want, washed out completely in denial. I was looking at the ceiling. 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 In the following wide-ranging excerpt, John discusses his own listening and reading habits, as well as details of his oratorio, El Nino. But first, I ask another question submitted by a member of the May Festival Chorus. What is the role of counterpoint in your music? Well, I, I'm essentially, I would say, a harmony-driven composer. I mean, obviously, a you know, a pulse driven composer as well. But, uh, you know, the first thing that uh, gets my engines running is, is the harmony. Um, counterpoint, of course, is, you know, we define it in music as the, um, you know, the balancing or coexistence of, of various melodic lines, or, you know, I suppose in the classic sense, it's various, mel various points of sound and when you study counterpoint you you know you become conscious of the movement of lines and how they balance each other how they contrast and how they uh how you achieve a sense of balance uh that's satisfying um and you go from uh collision to resolution uh one could say you go from pain to pleasure. Um, and, you know, I, I think in the case, obviously, the first name that always comes to anyone's mind when you say counterpoint is Bach, because, uh, you know, a Bach fugue uh, has this wonderful uh, environment. Uh, one could almost call it an ecology in which, in which these... Uh, melodic lines coexist in, in musical space. Um, and I get into those situations. You know, I, I, I create those ecologies, if I can use that term, um, where I, you know, I have to work very hard to balance my, uh, my lines. Uh, but I, I would say that I think most composers today are more, particularly in this country, they're more uh, harmony. Uh, their music's more generated by either harmony or by just uh, sound itself rather than by uh, extreme pitch consciousness. I remember when you were uh, in Cincinnati to conduct the Cincinnati Symphony in 2015, you led a performance of Scheherazade Point Two, uh, and then on the second half of the program was Pines of Rome. And in comments from the stage, you said that there are uh, very few perfect pieces of music 
and most of them are written by Mozart, <laughs> uh, but that you thought Pines of Rome might be a good candidate. And I wonder uh, if there are any other pieces of music that you might put on the list. Well, you know, I, I, I think, you know, a perfect is a dangerous word there because it, you know, it implies value. Um, you know, I, I like when I was touring around with Leela and, and my big piece at Pines of Rome was a good piece to do because first of all, it was familiar to the audience and, um, you know, having a, having a big new 50 minute contemporary piece is always a, a hard sell for an audience. So, uh, that was part of the reason that I, I would put a piece like Pines of Rome on, but I, you know, within its, within its context, I thought it was uh, beautifully wrought. I say R O W R O G H T. But I, I would not, you know, I wouldn't even begin to place that piece on the level with any of the really great music. Um, I guess the word uh, effective might be better than the word perfect. Yes, I think so. Definitely. Do you listen to music for enjoyment? Well, that's uh, that's a d difficult question to answer. I sometimes, uh, you know, when I talk to other young composers and I hear them say, oh, have you, have you heard this? And have you heard that? And, you know, particularly my son, who's uh, uh, a really wonderful composer, uh, he, he listens all the time. And I'm I'm ashamed of myself because I I think well no what have I listened to lately, um, you know I I spend so much of the day working on my own music um, that I I when I when I'm done like at six o'clock in the evening I, I usually just want to read um, uh, or uh, <laughs> shortly thereafter maybe watch television <laughs> just. <laughs> Because uh, my brain is is uh, is kind of overloaded uh, from just being with my own music, um, which is one reason I'm very grateful for the other part of my musical life, which is conducting. Because uh, when I, you know when I have to go uh, and conduct a program somewhere, um, then you know I'm I'm uh, urged or compelled to spend time. Uh, learning new repertoire and that gives me a great thrill because it isn't just listening casually it's it's very deep listening and studying of scores you know before this pandemic occurred i i was uh learning the sibelius first symphony which is one sibelius symphony that i i have yet to conduct and i um i was deeply into the piece uh, in a way that I just wouldn't be if I weren't performing it. And uh, likewise, last year I did Brahms IV for the first time and that was a great experience. But to answer your question more bluntly, I, I don't really listen to music um, in a kind of omnivorous state that I used to when I was um, younger. But I suppose that um there still are some of the works that you've mentioned uh, that you conduct that you might return to pieces of uh, standard repertoire classical music that you find very fulfilling. Well, of course, you know, I, we all have, uh, you know, playlists. So I guess most people listen on Spotify now, but I still have an iPod. And, you know, I, for example, I, I make a, very often I make a trip up the coast to where I am now. To, I have a, this little little hut cabin where I where I compose on the north coast of California, and it's a it's about a three to four hour drive. And I often listen to music, and um, you know I I have music that I I I return to over and over again. I, the Beethoven string quartets, for example, I love all of the Brahms uh, string chamber music, Debussy, orchestral works, you know, Stravinsky, Bach, uh, and a great deal of jazz. I, I listened to a lot of jazz, uh, mostly jazz from the 
40s, 50s, and 60s. You mentioned reading just a moment ago, and uh, it's become apparent to me in researching El Nino in preparation for our performance that the amount of reading you must have done for that piece only uh, suggests that you do quite a lot of reading uh, all the time. And I wondered if there's anything in particular that you think musical people or people who aspire to be musical should be certain to read. Oh, no, I think, I think reading is such a personal decision um, that I couldn't, I couldn't even begin to be prescriptive about that. Um, um, I, I've learned several European languages uh, in my lifetime. I uh, started with French and then German and then Spanish right around the time I was doing El Nino and, and then more recently Italian. And, you know, I, I don't speak them absolutely fluently, but I can get by in them. And, I, and more important, I, I can read in them now, and which gives me a great deal of pleasure. Uh, and in the case of El Nino, um, when my collaborator Peter Sellers suggests this idea of utilizing texts uh, by uh, Hispanic women, um, that was a, that was a motivation for me to actually start learning Spanish. Because if I was going to set these texts, I figured I'd better know what I was doing. I wondered if you could just reflect for a moment on uh, one of the more uh, ecstatic moments of that piece, which is the end of part one, the Christmas star, which mm -hmm. in and of itself, the text alone is extraordinary, but then this amazing tapestry of sound and also the uh, combination of that text with texts of Hildegard is um, quite unlike anything else in the repertoire, to say the least. Yeah, um, you know, I, I'm often asked, you know, what's, what's your favorite piece of yours? And, 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 you know, it's difficult to answer. I mean, I, I love Nixon in China. Um, and I'm always excited about the piece that I'm working on at the moment. But um, El Nino, I, I have a great special place in my heart for El Nino. And, and you know, part of it is just the story. Um, it's the nativity story, which is the ultimate birth story in Western culture. And um, I associate it with, a, uh, you know, a time of the year, uh, which is, you know, Christmas, which for me, it goes back all the way to my childhood and hearing, you know, an amateur local chorus uh, sing Handel's Messiah and, uh, all of Christmas carols and, and um, this wonderful myth of, of birth, um, which, which is a moment of, of promise and hope. And at the time I wrote El Nino, which was 1999, um, it was before you know, 9-11 and before the Iraq war and obviously before the terrible cursed polarization that's going on in the country right now. Uh, and it was a period of hope. Um, you know, we were beginning the new millennium and a lot of things seemed to be going right for humanity. So um, when I think about the piece and I think about the mood that I was in when I was composing it um, and these wonderful lines uh, for example the the child uh, um, the the song where the the, the three uh, the babe leapt in her womb where, where Mary is greeted by Elizabeth and uh, the two women who are pregnant um, share this unspoken joy and and mary feels the babe <laughs> literally move inside her uh you know those are just the most fundamental images of joy that you know are are just incom in, incomparable in our lives and uh 
that's the kind of sense of joy that permeates uh, El Nino. I was also charmed by the uh, inclusion of children's voices at the end, uh, which our own May Festival Youth Chorus were eagerly preparing uh, until the pandemic hit. Uh, and it's such a almost a refreshing change of tonal color to reserve them uh, until the very end. Was that specifically your intention or did it come about in a different way? You know, if I were a good German composer, like, you know, if I were like Wagner or something, I would have had that all planned from the very beginning <laughs> and and i you know the truth is that was an absolute last moment inspiration um uh the way the piece was created was was peter sellers and i uh met periodically over i don't know a three or four month period with just tons of poetry books and sources and and we crafted this libretto um and that particular poem was one of it's a very short poem by the mexican uh, poet rosario castellanos who's uh, several of her other poems are 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 used in that uh same oratorio 
and it was just there. I didn't have to use it, but it was this beautiful poem about, uh, uh, it's what in poetry we call an apostrophe, where you, you sing to someone. And in this case, the, the poet is singing to this crane, this heron. It's a, a heron, uh, Garza de la Llanora, um, uh, Lady of the, of the Plains, uh, of the Flatlands. Uh, when you bend over your waist, uh, I can't remember the exact words for it. Um, sings. But it's Canta. just, what is it? Your waist sings, that's right. Yeah. Canta, Canta, Canta tu yano, uh, centura. Canta tu centura. Um, and uh, I just don't know when the moment came when I thought, oh, this should be sung as a folk song by children and I just went with it and of course it became the most miraculous moment in in the uh in the whole evening because first of all um the crowd they may have seen the word children's chorus but by then they've totally forgotten that this in, they're involved and when we do it hopefully there's enough room on the stage so the children just walk out very quietly uh, during the piece uh, before that, and um, and they just start to sing. And of course, as you say, the, the tonality and the, this wonderful kind of freshness of voice um, is just uh, uh, such a beautiful moment. up uh, and be strong. Be a companion of my trees which are in my father's paradise. Open a watercourse beneath your roots which is hidden in the earth. And from it let flow waters to satisfy us. And the palm raised itself at once, and fountains of water, very clear and cold and sweet, began to pour out through the roots.
In the final segment of our conversation, I asked John, what's next? Here's what he had to say, along with his reflections on Cincinnati. Well, I just do one, take one thing at a time. And I'm currently working on a new opera uh, about which I don't have much to say at the moment. I'm still kind of finding my my voice with it. And um, I have probably another project in mind, but um, I think it's wise not to uh, overcommit yourself years in advance because you never know when you might have a crazy idea that you suddenly really need to do. Do you have any specific? You know, Wagner. Uh, Wagner was very busy with the ring, and then he just he just had one little idea that he wanted to get out of the way, which turned out to be Tristan and Isolde. And then, oh yeah, one other uh, little idea to get out of the way, which was my singer. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what's coming down the pike. That's true. Anyway, that's that's uh, basically what what I you know how I operate. Well, I'll ask you one more question and then let you mm -hmm. return to this new opera. Uh, do, okay. you have, do you happen to have any um, specific memories of your previous visits to Cincinnati to work with the orchestra and the chorus? Well, I'm very fond of the Cincinnati Symphony. Um, I've been going there to conduct, I think, probably at least 20 years. Um, and uh, I... I have yet to perform there since the hall's been renovated. So I, I hear it's really terrific. Uh, I think you have one of the most exciting and imaginative and personable music directors anywhere in the world. Um, and uh, a very informed and so musically sophisticated community. So what more could a composer and conductor ask for? This concludes my conversation with John Adams, and with it, our series of live webcasts as part of the 2020 May Festival's online offerings. We do have one more event, however. We hope you'll listen tomorrow night at 8 p.m. as WGUC broadcasts a live recording of the Verdi Requiem from the 2018 May Festival, featuring the May Festival Chorus, the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, soprano Michelle Bradley, mezzo-soprano Ekaterina Semenchuk, tenor Brian Heimel, and bass John Relier. The conductor in her Cincinnati debut is Un Sun Kim. Listen on your radio at 90.9 or online at mayfestival.com, where you can read our listening guide and chat with other listeners and May Festival conducting fellow Joseph Taff. Our thanks go to the technical and production staff of the May Festival and the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra for producing this series of webcasts, and to our marketing and communications team for making them available online. We encourage you to stay connected to the May Festival through our website and by following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. On behalf of all of us at the May Festival, I'm Matthew Swanson. Stay well and keep singing. <laughs>